minus 30 seconds. T minus 20 seconds. Do, do more in the future trap yes. talk podcasts yes man only, only trap talk exclusive yes. exclusive <laughs> oh so stop calling us from <laughs> <laughs> the spot get the club to pop when i come up with the drop god love it love it or not i'm hot from the hop to the club to spot get the club to pop when i come up with the club to spot get the club to pop when i come up with the club to spot get the club to pop when i come up Get the club to pop when I come up with you. Everybody, we do it. Everybody, we do it. You are now tapped into the coolest reptile podcast in the world. Welcome to the Trap Talk Reptiles podcast, episode 319. This one hits different, guys. I'm not going to lie. Right here next to me, we have the man himself, Brian Waterloo. Hey, folks. How you doing, man? I'm great. How are you? Yeah, what a pleasure. What hey, a listen, pleasure. Uh, I, I got so much to say, but before I get ahead of myself, I do want to say, if this is your first time tapping in, please do me a favor. Uh, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell. That way you're on top of every single Trap Talk Reptile podcast on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, Google Play, all the major podcasting platforms. Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. But man, I had the pleasure of meeting Brian over a year ago. I want to say a year ago, I met him at uh, at a Tinley, March Tinley, through John, good old John from Sim Container. And um, I said, man, I, once I found out, first and foremost, you're like a fucking unsung hero. I, I, I don't feel like... Unless you're in the lace monitor game, people know who you are. Like, and, and what's crazy because I knew of John, but then John's like, no, 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 look, 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 at, look at, you know, he talks, no, no, check him out, look, look at Brian Waterloo. And I was like, holy shit. And I was so floored, man. And then you're like, MJ, I'm like 30 minutes away. So it was very overwhelming uh, because, you know, every time I come to a, a remote show or episode, I, I'm everything's planned out. My whole fucking trip's planned out. So I've been wanting to come to this place for over a year. And it has hit every expectation beyond, man, I just, I got to say, man, what a sick-ass piece of property you have. Well, I'm really glad you made it. And I'm glad that John, thank you, John, for the acknowledgement. Um, you made it out here and you were able to do some vaccine stuff and yeah. check everything out, check out some cages, see how we, I do everything out here. And it, it's really, it's been a great experience. And this is just such a professional setup and I, I love it and I'm really impressed and I'm just glad that you were able to make it. Yeah. And, you know, able to see how I kind of, you know, make everything happen here with the lace and, you know, how my cages are and how my setups are and, you know, what's kind of involved with keeping the species because they're, they're not for everybody. No, they seem to be quite popular right now, but you know, there's a lot of things you need to know about to keep them, you know, properly house and to keep them breeding and make them more prevalent in the States, which is, you know, a great goal of mine. And hopefully they just continue to be, you know, available in the States because they're an awesome species. And, you know, I can't but, but say enough. About if we were to be honest, Brian, for the, 
any monitor like advocate like, like a person who likes their monitors and studies their monitors a lot of people the lace monitors are a dream species like I, I can't tell you how many people say if i could have any monitor oh yeah it would be a lace um, yeah lace uh, definitely they've been you know one of the cadillac species that are out there from a an australian or australian perspective or even just you know generalization i mean obviously everyone's got the big heart on for perennies and those would be the greatest yeah, where species those at? in the world. Like, but I mean, who has those? I mean, like as I'm, far as breeding them out. I'm working with two zoos right now to get <clears> perennies <throat> in the states. Um, it's not a given. It's not a hundred percent, but you know, just put those aside and be happy with uh, the availability uh, availability of lace right now. I mean, yeah. whether you're looking for normals, or you're looking for bells. I mean, it, it's it's happening. And they're out there and they're available. And it's definitely a species that, you know, a lot of people need to consider being like the, the cream of the crop and, you know, take advantage of what's available because, you know, not a lot of us are breeding them and, you know, they could disappear overnight. So, right. you know, be grateful for what's out there and take advantage of it. Yeah, definitely. And I think with the, Best thing about what people should be looking forward to tonight's episode is like us really tapping into what to expect when, you know, like for instance, <clears throat> I got my adult pair from Sim Container, right? But here I am, you know, thinking, not thinking, but I'm not gonna lie to you. Um, like I was told around two to three is a good time to, you know, see if they could breed. But I mean, that's kind of like, why even fucking push the envelope? And, and and that even goes for so many other things that we breed in this reptile industry is like, what's the whole point of rushing it, right? I mean. From, if we could kind of dip into the kind of like 180 on what happens when you feel like you could do something at a younger age. And if we, even if you get a little bit of success with it, that doesn't mean the next time around is going to be so easy. Right. And that's kind of what I want to talk about the laces and, and people need to understand because <clears throat> breeding's popular, man. Breeding is in, you know, and, and even though there's shit hitting us with us arc, please go support us arc, by the way, uh, shout out to Phil Goss and us arc Florida, but you know, you see what's happening there all the time. So at the end of the day, people like, you know, Mason, you know, Mason, yeah. Right? Shout out to Mason, man. Hey, not, Mason. Shout out to Mason Barnes. Uh, but you know, younger guy, but super into oh, yeah. the, the laces, like that head can. over heels. Right. Yeah. So I'm saying if you're trying to be, if you want to get into something like that, you need that kind of dedication. Like you need to be asking questions, going yeah. to monitor fest. Definitely. Like you got to be tapped into it. You would say, right. Yeah. And Mason definitely, he made it to monitor fest. I'll give him that credit. <laughs> um, but yeah, you definitely, this is a species you have to be dedicated towards. Um, you need to realize that they need a lot of space. Um, not just giant spaces, but they definitely require certain, you know, aspects of housing that, you know, the average herper who maybe had, you know, a couple of king snakes or, hey, I had a leopard gecko or whatever. I mean, right. you know, place, <clears throat> it's a whole different aspect. And you need to, Take that into consideration and you need to kind of plan a you know currently or basically break it down to where you're like current future future prospects the whole nine yards so you need to kind of you know visualize what you're capable of doing and how many you know if you got one pair if you got two pairs or you got one male and two females, whatever. But you need to visualize their cages. You need to understand how much room they require. And so even so, I don't mean to stop you there, Brian. But even before you even think about how many you want, you should figure out the space size first. Exactly, and that's a big component to being successful or being a complete fa uh, failure with the species. Because you know, again, a female, a mature female that you know, maybe three or four years old, that's you know, in that correct age where she's producing and then you got a male that's paired up with her is five or six feet long you need to understand that they require a large enclosure something that you cannot buy from any of the you know typical reptile oh let me pause that you ready you're gonna laugh at this brian oh man so brian's been dude you've been any question i've had with laces brian fuck you hit me with the facts and i love it man and i remember i'll never forget telling you Cause you told me this, you're like, don't get that PVC shit, cause mm -hmm. it ain't gonna work. And I no. just, I just got 
<laughs> I had just got an eight foot tall, four foot deep, six foot across PVC enclosure. Biggest fucking piece of shit ever, bro. I fucking hate it. Like, trust me, it works, but I'm not happy with it. Bro. Well, here, I'm not happy with I'll, it. Bro. I'll play devil advocate to glass it. Glass doors. Now, yeah, Terrible. Got glass doors, but the upside to it, outside of a fucking aquarium, is <laughs> if it's PVC, you could drill into it. You could put branches. You could make this bag. Right. And because of the size of it, you do have some elements of workability to where you can make it happen. The only thing is with the height. Right. But that being said, aquariums are just, they're a dead end. Because, 100%. like I said, you can't drill into them at all. So the PVC cages, I'm not completely against, but the amount of money that you're going to spend for that PVC cage, I can make a cage out of wood. And yeah. you know, cement board and two by four is whole nine yards for a fraction of the cost, and you can make it that much more bigger. So again, caging is definitely there's different elements to it because you got your male and you got your female. You got a pair, you want to separate them. Um there's definitely a lot of give and play to it, but again. You need room. There's no way around of it. getting around it. Right. You can't keep, you know, a four foot female lace monitor in a 50 gallon aquarium. So, you know, aquariums, the PVC cages that are meant for snakes, you got to get away from it because there's just there's no no end to it. And if you go that route, then you're just you're sacrificing the animals because they're not getting the proper heat, the care. You know, just the, the regular behavior that they require in captivity that you're not going to be able to allow in a small, tiny enclosure. So, again, you just, you look at it from that perspective, you know, you don't want to keep, you know, a parrot in an aquarium. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. Exactly. So, again, you got to think outside of the box with monitors. And it doesn't matter if these are Kimberly Rock monitors Ackies, you know, roughnecks, water monitors, whatever. The bigger the space, the better. To some extent, which we'll get into later when it goes into, you know, the breeding aspect right. and, you know, nesting and all that. But overall, just don't rely on a two foot by four foot by four foot PVC cage for a lace monitor that you're planning to keep for its entirety. As a hatchling, yeah, that's fine. But as a semi-adult into an adult, there's just no way you can do it. It's terrible. And, and one thing I want to give you mad props on. By the way, guys, just be ready. First and foremost, go subscribe to my other YouTube channel, The Trap Vlogs, because before tonight's episode, I was able to kind of dive deep on this guy's, uh, you know, just what he has going on with his caging. And the first thing I, I, I was like, dude, this guy is nonstop evolving. It's like he showed me the first one. And then you kept telling me how you're just continuously mm -hmm. coming up with more prototypes and they keep getting bigger and they keep getting more impressive. Like, man, I got to tell you the whole foam, the foam idea with the, the concrete uh, sculpting and all that stuff that you have, man. I mean, I don't want to say like, I don't say, oh, man, how do you do? I, mean, I feel like anyone could do that if you just put in the work. Right? Well, the, the nice thing about it is, you know, that whole idea came from. You know, growing up in Chicago, I, you know, Brookfield Zoo, Lincoln Park Zoo, um, they had massive enclosures and a lot of species. Right. And, you know, they're they're phenomenal. And it doesn't matter if you go, you know, across the seaboard to San Francisco, New York, whatever. Um, a lot of those components were made out of gunite. And gunite is a concrete that basically it's a spray foam or a spray concrete. But... It's a real specialized concrete. It's like your uh, figure, folks, your in-ground pools in, like, Arizona. You know, it's all gunite. And it's a specialty tool to make it. It's specially mixed and all that. So I kind of went outside of the box. And I'm like, well, maybe we could do something with, you know, just regular cheap concrete or even mason mix. Use it with the foam. Um, like I was telling MJ, there's, fortunately, there's a, a company contractor up the road for me that specializes in doing, like, you know, landscaping and rock structures with, all, with certain concrete mixes. But even if you don't have that down the road from you, um, you could still 
get creative with like cement board, a couple two by fours, and just regular old mason mix, which I've been talking about for years. Right. Um, fortunately, I'm not making big logs and you know have a big you know how to do whatever. But there's so much info on YouTube and like online to figure out how you could do some of these structures using like cement board, mason mix and all that. And it makes a huge difference. And I was just playing the MJ earlier too. Another option, especially with like your pigment monitors, your smaller species is using foam and dry lock, which is super cheap, very lightweight. Anyone can kind of do it. You don't need any specialty tools. I mean, you're talking like paintbrushes and like a carving knife. I mean, there's definitely a lot of options, but you got to take that into consideration when you want so many species and you want to put them in, you know, ideal enclosures and, you know, not shortcut them. Right. So, you know, it, again, it, it comes down to your space and your availability. I mean, if you have, you know, let's say this, this office that me and MJ are in right now, it's probably a, what, 12 by 12 by 12 or whatever. Right. You don't want to put 15 croc monitors in here. Obviously, you're limited with your space. So right. you want to take it into consideration and be like, hey, you know, this back wall here, I could probably put, you know, four or five Aki pairs and make them in a nice big giant enclosure. Perfect. And maybe over here, I'll put, you know, a pair of lace. And that's it. You're done. You know, you don't want to go outside of that, you know, range and be like, oh, I'm going to put here and here and here. I mean... Again, you got to take that in consideration with the size of the animals, the separation of the animals, which is a big key, which a lot of people overlook at times, and, you know, how accessible it is to get in the cage. I mean, literally, MJ, you don't want a cage that's, like, this wide, and you got two little doors, and you got a light bulb all the way back there you got to change, and it's like, well, right. how am I going to access it? So, I mean, one of the most common things, I mean, I don't want to say most common because I don't want to discredit anyone out there who keeps laces, but... Some of the laces I've seen out there have these big blotched, like, burn marks on them. Yeah. Um, and can we kind of explain how that comes about? Like, yeah. where, and that's, where, where a lot of these burn marks come from? The burn marks, unfortunately, is, you know, you got to understand, again, when you're, and it doesn't matter if it's a lace. This could be any lizard, any snake, you know, any species that you could think of is, you know, when they, they're basking, they're stretching out their whole body. So if you have... Right above, like, my head here, you got one light, and your lizard is this long. So he's got this one light where it's like, oh, there's all this heat right here, and he's sitting underneath there for, you know, an hour or two. He's going to burn. Right. So all my cages, which you'll see later in hopefully the videos that MG posts, I have, like, a, a track system, and it basically, it allows... Because it's a track, there's a light, a light, a light, a light. So basically, when they go underneath of the bass, there's a whole equal amount of lights underneath there. So basically, they're not sitting in one spot. Because again, you got to remember that, you know, lizards, monitors, um, any species, squamata, whatever, their, their pain refer or tolerability is a lot higher than us they'll sit under one spot and they'll just be melting <laughs> they'll burn because that's crazy this part of their head is not warm enough and then back here is not warm enough but because right here at the center where they're sitting is hot they don't know the rest of their body is is not warm so mm. they'll just they'll cook they'll burn that's why you need to have a nice even flow platform a platform somewhere for them to get up on a higher ledge and then come up there. What about, lay down. what about the trunk? Like, what about the, I mean, let's talk about the branches. Like you, we can't put no puny ass little branches. No, like they, they you need can't. something to put their body go flat on, which I've seen. Bigger. It doesn't matter to species either is, you know, I've seen plenty of times where people have had a branch like the size of a Sharpie and then they'll have one here and I'll have one here. And then you got like a Euromastic in there. And it's like, what the hell are you thinking? That wizard, that lizard's width is like this big. And it's going to lay on two toothpicks, literally. And it's not going to support them at all. So depending on the species, 
you always want to go bigger and better, bigger with the width of their branches because they want to feel something secure. Right. I don't care if you're talking about a, a, a tree monitor, a green tree monitor that's a foot and a half long. They don't want to lay on a little twig. They want a big, solid branch to where their arms, the rear legs, they everything flatten out. They're flattened out. Mm. Now, granted, the rest of the cage, especially like species like Tristus, Brannus Tristus, the Kimberleys, um, they like those bigger branches for basking. But they also like snags because they like to jump and kind of move around from, you know, different aspects of their enclosure. So I'm not basically butting those out. But what I'm saying is your main basking areas, you want big, thick branches where they can completely lay around them and they're, they're, they're secure. They feel every inch of their body on those branches. So... That's something that the kind of consider with, you know, your enclosure designs and what you want to do for your lace or like your Mertens or even your Niles, a big Alaris, the whole nine yards. They need that width. And like I said, depending on that species, again, like, you know, something like green tree moths, persinus, they love little snags and they love to jump from one to the next. But what they don't want is a twig underneath the basking light because it, it's not going to be efficient. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, they, like at the end of the day, they want security. Exactly. And, and a little tiny twig doesn't make them feel secure. No. And, and they can't hang out. They just... No. Because they, they go from hanging out to just, phew, they're gone. Like, exactly. They're, they're, they're spazzy. Tree monitors are spazzy. I mean, green tree monitors from what I know. Um, but, you know... About the, the whole complex. Generally, you know, the, the tree monitors, I mean, you got to think about it from their perspective. You know, they're upper canopy and you know there's a lot of shading they're hiding from everything they're you know finding their niche where they're eating big grasshoppers big locusts right fledgling birds whatever but anytime they expose yourself to you know bright light or whatever right. it, there's prey there's plenty of birds there's plenty of you know species of snakes right. other lizards the whole nine yards so yeah the flightiness of a lot of your percentage or a lot of your piggy monitors is natural that's right. just you know it's hardcore hardwired evolutionary things in their minds where it's like hey you know fight or flight right so some of the bigger species <clears throat> over time you know i've had niles that are you know they, i could run up to them with my lawnmower they're like yeah bring your best game they don't care i mean they're they're just you know, once they become like the big alpha animals, they lose a lot of their fear. How many, how many, because this is something that I've started to learn over time um, that could possibly make sense. I do want to give somebody mad props. That's who's in the chat. My boy, Eddie from Father Blue. I don't know if you know who Father Blue is. Big tree monitor keeper in yes. the East Coast. He's uh, he, he did the nest thing. Right. So there you this, go. I mean, I, I don't want his passion second to none behind this stuff because he's just starting to put a lot of focus of like, the possibilities of first and foremost like a, a monitor would lay high altitude to be away from predators you think like even a lace monitor how do you think a lace monitor has ever laid in a, a boreal type mound do you think yeah there's been documentation of lace monitors um nesting in a boreal termite mounds but wow. it seems to be the norm where they're you know it's more terrestrial right. however um i have seen like a boreal nest box or a boreal termite mounds, especially with it. And it covers like the whole percentage complex, blues, right. yellows, greens, the whole nine yards. So I think a lot of it, it could depend on, you know, where that particular um, range of tree monitors is. Maybe they're like, Hey, you know, termite mounds were working great over here, but where my general range is, I'm right up by riverbed and there's flooding every six months right so using the ground is pointless and then you know and again a lot with your boreal tree monitors your, your whole percentage complex you know they're pretty boreal so um utilizing a, a boreal termite mount is perfect when you think about the less predation that's going to happen um not only that just the whole atmosphere 
of where that nest box is. Now, the, the turbine mount is above ground, so you don't have any, you know, predator basically stuck to land that could screw with it. Um, you're kind of, you're in a sunlight. I mean, you're above the canopy or whatever, and it's, in a lot of ways, it's like, it's ideal. And plus, because they're an arboreal species, you know, from everything I've learned and everything I've heard about, you know, the Persinus complex is whether they're nesting in the ground or they're nesting, you know, in like a boreal tree, they're basically, they're in the owner's story. They're not going on the ground. They're maybe a couple feet off the floor of the ground because there's, you know, insects that are moving up and down. I mean, there's more availability, uh, availability, availability of right. prey as opposed to them, you know, getting on the ground. And a lot of those uh, species complex, you know, the chondroveritis, your green tree pythons, are found in the same areas. And green trees love lizards. That's like their main prey is hatchling. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of uh, avoiding the predator-prey relationship to get away from that aspect of a higher survival. Personally, I think species like water monitors have a higher mortality rate because of how many they produce. Right. Compared to something like any of your percentages. Um, and, you know, even like the lakes. Lakes are producing maybe six to eight hatchlings a year. But they have a higher, you know, success rate of making it to adulthood or whatever. But um, your less prolific species seem to have a higher success rate because it's, you know, dependent on where the females are nesting, um, the general environment, and... I mean, let's talk, talk about the reality, though. If they don't have enough options to get something that they want, things could go wrong. Correct. But I think the other half of it, too, is they look at, I think, predation. Like what could get the, what could get to their eggs. And exactly. Like Not only their eggs, but the success rate of their hatchlings. That's why I think, hmm. again, something like the persistence complex, it makes sense to, hey, I'm going to use a termite mound that's way up there. It's way aboreal. When my eggs hatch, them hatchlings are going to be in the understory anyways. There's a lot more insects. There's not big predators that are coming up there. If they do, it's kind of rare and few in, in between compared to, you know, something like a water monitor that's nesting in the ground and it's shitting out 60 eggs. And, you know, you got a male water monitor. You got this mammal. You got you know, this bird, whatever, they start hatching out, you got crocodiles, a whole nine yards, and they're just going to go to town on them. So I think a lot of ways, species of monitors or species of lizards in that general um, that produce smaller hatchlings or smaller offspring or smaller clutches, I guess, for that matter, they have a higher success rate because if they didn't, they'd be wiped off the planet. They'd be gone. Yeah, I mean, think about it. If you're... <clears throat> You know, insert your lizard here, your green Jamaican <laughs> frog jumper. And it's like, hey, it produces two eggs a year and it lays them in the ground. It's like, well, you know, there's a possum top there that digging into it. It's like, well, how are they surviving? Well, then he, I don't know, figured out, I'll go two feet up this tree where there's a little termite mound. I'll lay my eggs in there. And then when my hatchlings come out, they'll hang out in this upper story and maybe they'll have a better success rate. So that's like an ebb and flow. How would you maybe approach trying to implement an arboreal, or an arboreal uh, nesting box for your laces, like especially in something as big as what you're building? Well, I haven't gone that route. I think a lot of it too is because a lot of the information that because I, I will I will say this, Brian, your your nest box out of all the nest boxes I've seen are, are is the smallest. Everything else, oh yeah, they're every, tiny. Everything I've seen is like been huge. Yeah. And 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 that, and like I said, you obviously you you fucking are based in everything off your own experience. So Brian does what Brian is seeing, and I see well, that that works for you. Yeah, and, and a lot of it too is um, I got there's so many different components to it. Um, 
basically from a science perspective again this is based on like anyone that's working with lace monitors i definitely recommend you look up dave kirchner's Croc Doc videos online on YouTube. Dude, that guy's a G, bro. He's a genius. And I oh, literally, I, like I have guy, based man. everything that I've been successful with off of his tutelage. I mean, no. I, I, me I'm and obsessed Dave, with his videos, bro. That guy's the man. Yeah, we go <laughs> way back, but I have followed everything that Dave has basically told me to a T. And essentially, as small as my nest boxes are, the whole point of it is that it's effective. And you know, again, this kind of opens up another line of discussion where, you know, it comes down to caging and it comes down to, you know, um, how you're setting them up and the availability and your substrate and all that. I mean, literally, I've had buddies that have had, you know, enclosures that are just giant. They're, you know, the size of this office. Right. And... You know, you got a female that's ready to lay eggs, and she's now searching everywhere, trying to find a nest or, you know, a nest box to lay her eggs. And the problem with it is it's not – you don't want to give them too many options, but if you give them too many options, it, it you're basically you're, – you're running out of time. Remember, you're female. Once she's gone through the whole cycle, she's ovulated. She's like – you know, 10 to 15 days ready to lay. And now, you know, she's been searching throughout the whole enclosure for the last month and a half looking for a nest spot. And you have so many different things available to her. You kind of throw her off. It's almost like a, a frustration aspect. Or I mean, you know, my one buddy, John Egan, who I love, great guy, he was – really successful at breeding lace. In fact, he was one of the guys who had a giant enclosure with a bunch of adults. And not only did his lace breed, the female laid eggs. And not only that, they hatched. And, you know, he found like a lone hatchling walking around his cage in one day. And he's like, Jesus Christ. He's like, they, they freaking, they did everything. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Time out. Wait, he yeah. found a lone hatchling? Yeah. I've always was curious. Okay, because you got people who do maternal incubation with snakes all the yep. time. Like, I, has nobody even tried doing that with the laces yet? Like, that's no. crazy. John, John Egan did it. With I'll one. give him all the credit in the world. Yeah, John basically Not the John. had a huge enclosure. And like I said, he, you know, he was like looking in his cage one day. He's like, is that a fucking baby? And then sure enough, there's a little lace walking around. He's like, holy shit. They laid their eggs. They incubated perfectly and they hatched. So um, wow. fast crazy. forward a couple hundred years later. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I have pictures of John where he literally, he's like up to his waist digging up eggs that were buried so deep down in that soil that he had and again it was it, it worked out it was perfect but how many feet would you say he had like what, like four, four feet yeah. and it's like literally up to his waist and i'm like and they dude you need a nest box they went to the very corner they did it everywhere oh everywhere okay. yeah there it was all over the place again john sorry if i'm you know shitting on you or raining on your parade or miss speaking or whatever but still i mean I, that's the first just, guy i've ever heard who had dude that. he nailed it Wow. with that cage but my point was like it's so much easier if you just kind of make it smaller and you give the female less options and again i'm not trying to you know take anything away from a female the whole point is that again you put in all this time and effort to get everything going right. and now your females put everything into it into it and she's like holy shit I got eggs. I want to make them happy. You know, this is, again, this is all biological, hardwire. You know, this is what I need to do. So why not ease it as much as you can so she doesn't have a bunch of options that she's got to, you know, filter through in the course of like 15 to 30 days. So the ease of having that nest box and having it kind of stand out away from everything else and using a small amount of substrate, it eases her tension. 
And then she's like, well, shit, this is perfect. I'll, you know, let me start digging in here. And then when she starts digging in there, it's like perfect heat, perfect temperature, perfect humidity, perfect passion of substrate, perfect substrate. This is it. I'm ready to go. You mean the magic, the magic, the magic dirt? Yeah. Yeah. The cocoa. Yeah. Um, but the other half of it too is, you know, other aspects of the nesting is, you know, the humidity levels, the passion of the substrate. That's a big thing too. And you need to be packed the fuck out, right? Like oh, I'm yeah. talking about stomped out. Like yeah, literally. If it's loose, they ain't happy. No, yeah. I have. I actually got a picture of it. It's on my computer. Um, which I sent the cursor to Dave. Um, literally, I got the nest box on the, the floor of my garage. <laughs> and it's just a picture of my two feet standing on a board. And I took like a selfie of it. And I'm packing it. He's like, keep packing. And yeah. it was like, you know, there you go. You just, that substrate needs to be so compact that literally, it, you know, Heaven and Earth got to freaking move it, nice. which is amazing because turret mounds in the wild are like, you know, Thick. like this. They're like, yeah. you know, a half inch, three quarter inches of like just hard, just dirt. hard freaking concrete because they, you know, when they cultivate their fungi and all that crap, yeah. they just harden. They make this hard shell. Yeah. And I've like hit it with a slant and when I was in Australia, they like hit it with a freaking with a hammer and i'm like i'm not breaking anything yeah. and them females are just like <sighs> they just right. they they take it tear through it they make their way through it i mean how i know uh i think it was dave carter or brian weavers two guys who did a lot of field work in australia um in particular on lace uh nesting and all that um they put wire mesh and the females still rip through the wire mesh wow. to get to that termite mouth so yeah females are very particular about making sure that that nest box is completely compact and you know and, and then imagine like compacting a four foot fucking nest box like jesus christ that's a lot well, that's the other thing too is that you know my initial nest box was just it was enormous it was like the size of something you'd give for like a water monitor right. it's like Huge. four foot long two foot wide two foot tall and i'm like you know, I need three guys. Literally, like, I had three guys fucking help me pick it up to put it in the cage. And then <laughs> I'm sending pictures of Dave. And Dave is like, why is it so big, mate? I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean? I, don't know, I thought that's how big. He's like, fuck no. He's like, it's this, this, that. So my nest box is literally, it's like two feet long, 16 inches wide, and like 13 inches tall. So it's half the size. But it's completely freaking packed. Right. And there's like not an ounce of space that is not completely just filled just with that substrate and covered. Right. And then even the entrance hole, which, you know, it's a four inch diameter. So once I put that lid on there, I just pack the shit out of that and I just keep packing it, packing it. So basically, you know, there's that lid. So what you don't want to have happen, folks, is if this is open and she gets in here like this, this is shit. She needs to go Straight right down. here and start digging to start getting inside of there. She shouldn't be able to be, go through the like the sides. No. And she, she should not be down. able to get in and be like, hey, this is real nice. Here's a bunch of substrate. I'm going to nest here. It's all loose. She's yeah. got to get from here and be like, fuck, I got to dig all this shit out. That's how you do it. And that's the natural instinct that they feel like we're in the right place. Yeah, because, wow. again, figure here's your termite mom. She's got to come right here and just start scraping away at the very tip before she gets to right here, which is all the good stuff. But she's got this whole layer of crap she's got to dig through. So if your nest box doesn't have that, it ain't going to happen. Okay, so here we go. We're going to get into the next subject about nest boxing uh, because – Shit, man. Obviously, it all comes down to that nest box or whatever nesting option for that female. It comes down to her wanting that to be the place, right? Um, my female, Christina, is laid January 4th. Okay. Um, I went ahead and removed the eggs, redid the nest box, compacted the share of it, just like starting all over, right? And then as soon as I paired her up with the male again, 
without before any locks, she started kind of digging around again. Huh. Now, if she's already digging around and maybe she could be building, but there's no like actual breeding going on yet. Sometimes you like, for instance, with the laces, I could tell you right now, and one thing I'm going to readjust when I get home is give them a fucking smaller goddamn nest box. I can tell you right now, they're too big. I big enough to where I can guarantee that it's not compact the way it needs to be because the, the fucking mail gets in there. Dirt's everywhere. Okay. Yeah. So when do you, you inter when, when do you intervene? Like, when do you fucking like, oh my God, they kicked all the dirt off, pack it again. Or, or do you have to regroup or figure it out? Um, that's what I'm trying to figure out because obviously Brian and you, you, you did say you were cool with talking about this, um, but you went through a pretty fucked up situation where a female laid for you. You thought everything was cool. Did a little bit to her nest boxing, but then she ended up just dying right, yeah. right, right yeah. next to the desk. No, I, I lost both of my, you know, okay, both permanent crop females. Um, the one female, I believe, oh, sucks. I'm sorry, man. Oh, that's no problem. It, it, this is part of keeping yeah. them. Um, the, the original female, the one I probably produced like ninety percent of my hatchling from. This one? Um, no, not her. Okay. Um, that's a new female. So the, no, none of these passed away then? No, no, these are okay. They're still. I saw right them now. today. Then. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, no, the very original, original female. Um, my thesis on that and why she died is, you know, she she's been bred. I don't know, six years in a row, seven years in a row, and I produced a shitload of babies from her. And from a wild perspective, um, I think I just burnt her out. It's basically, I, you know, you gotta remember lace in the wild are a species that, you know, we're getting honed in to start breeding at like two, three years of age. Where in the wild, they're maybe breeding at five or six years of age. Wow. And, they're producing maybe one clutch where the first year that female I, I had one clutch in a year or the lifetime. What do you mean? One clutch in a year. Okay. But that's not basically, you know, Hey, the next year it is definite. We're going to produce another clutch. Okay. A lot of options. There's a lot of variability in the so. wild mm -hmm. where that female I had that first year that I finally got her to go. I got six clutches of eggs from her, which is unheard of. That's, insane so um her i believe i just you know burnt her out not from a bad husbandry a husbandry perspective or you know you're doing it is it, literally once you get them going they don't stop you have to do everything you can to get them to stop brumation cutting off feed the whole nine yards but you know, like I said before in our other podcast, it's a fine balance because, you know, you want to get them enough energy and enough food in their system after they laid that last clutch. But you need to find that perfect taper to get them to where they're not going to go into another cycle. Because if you do, at that point, it's like, well, fuck it. I'm already involved. Keep feeding them. And that's exactly what happened with me. That first year, because I had boom, boom, boom. I got three clutches, and then fourth clutch, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna shut her off with some food, and then it's like one or two extra mice, and boom, she's into another cycle. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So I was like, all right, well, screw it. I'm not gonna, you know, jeopardize it. Keep feeding her. I mean, they just keep going and going and going. So there's definitely a fine line to where you need to essentially find that perfect imbalance where you could shut them off um so a lot of ways that original female i'm pretty sure that that was her demise i think i just burnt her out because you know i produced a bunch of babies with her and then you know my all black female which unfortunately that was my first born that was the first lace i ever hatched um i fucked with her nest she had laid in october last year in tinley as soon as I got home from Tinley, I dug up her, her clutch of eggs, and uh, she went into another cycle, and everything was on the up and up. But um, I screwed around with her nest a couple of times, so backfilling it. She would dig it. I'd backfill it again. So I, I kept fucking with it. I should have just left it alone and left her be because 
obviously she had found like that sweet spot where she's like, all right, this is perfect. This is where we're going to lay the eggs, you know? And then I come in there and I'm like, Oh, I'm doing good. I'm going to backfill here and do that. And <laughs> yeah, I think I just, yeah. you know, threw her off. She's like, all right, well, screw it. This next box has got too much disturbance. I'm not going to do it. And you know, I, that's a shit the bet on it. It went from, you know, but this, this is just a good guess though, too, at the end of the day. Right. I mean, I mean, you, that, can't, you can't really it, determine. Yeah, the no, it's not a hundred percent. It's just what you can think of. It was my, you know, experience and dealing with them. Like, you know, I think that's what I might've did is I just screwed with the nest too much. So for instance, now, like I was saying back to my Priscina is like ever since I saw her digging a little bit, well, now the male's starting to breed her again. Um, it, it, am I best just leave that nesting alone then? Or, or, or should I pack it? I mean, what do I do at that point? Well, it, it, again, this is where it's like a, because I could see there's like movement. Like I could, I mean, trust me, the hole's perfect enough for her where the milk can't fit in, yeah. but there's space in there. Like I could see there's space. And I don't know if it's a space where she's already dug a tunnel or if it's her just fucking around. Like I don't. Yeah. And unfortunately, again, certain species are not, you know, you. It's all different. It's all different. The lace like them super packed. Um, I've heard what certain uh, percentage, like when I <clears throat> had my percentage lay, um, it was a soft compact. It wasn't like completely squeezed and just like, you know, inert. Um, it was kind of soft, but it was still for, you know, where there was a formation where it could kind of tunnel in. So in your perspective, yeah, I get what you're saying to where it's like, do you want to refill it? Do you want to fuck with it? I mean, you know, every, obviously something is working for her to go that far into it. So, um, and how much of the temps are you paying attention to? Like, I mean, like, well, how much of that are you taking into consideration? Or are you just, I mean, because some people have, you know, they have certain heat going on in their soil all through the night and shit like that. Are you, is everything just ambient? Is everything based off what the heat provides? Like what the enclosure heat provides, that's what the nest box gets? No, because the, the nest box you want separate because you got to remember, again, wherever these monitors are laying, there's a consistency in the temperature. That's what they're looking for. That's the whole aspect of laying, you know, laying because hey, I, I found that perfect plane where it's between 87, 85, 84. So it's like, hey, I got that happy medium. If you shut off the light and you shut off the heat, and then it's like, all right, that went from 78 to 75, then yeah, you're you're screwed. So that consistent temperature is fine. And that's exactly what they're looking for from a animal perspective or like, you know, a husbandry perspective. Yeah. When you're shutting off the lights at the end of the night, they're fine. They don't give a shit. They can cool off. That's fine. It's, you know, part of nature and it gets cold in the tropics, cold in Australia. It's, it's natural. America. It's natural, but where they are investing all that time and energy to put their eggs, it's consistent. Right. That's the difference. So from that aspect, yeah, you don't want to, you know, you got your nest area, your nest box, nest, everything is set up. You don't want to interrupt that. I mean, you would say just as important as it is to figure out the size of the enclosure you could provide for these monitors, that nesting is second and is important, you feel like? I mean, I mean. Nesting is probably your number one priority. As soon as you know you have a male and a female and your goal is like, hey, I need to get a bread. Your nest box should be your number one priority. And you need to know what has worked in the past with that species, whether it's a Kimberly rock monitor, an Aki, a lace, savanna, water monitor, whatever, because they all have different preferences. But the whole point is prior to any breeding, prior to any pairing or whatever, that female is going to take her general caging her housing her you know this is my homestead this is where i live one of the key things she's going to look at is where's the best place to bask and where can i lay eggs so the nesting aspect that nest box or that that deep substrate whatever they need that's crucial because that's going to guide you into the next steps are her going into vital genesis going into ovulation going into copulation, the whole layer. If nesting is not there, then everything is just out the window. That's a 
primary thing that she's going to look at. Once she's established and once she's of age and she's getting, again, this is a hardwired behavior with them. It's not like, you know, hey, I think she wants to breed today. It's, you know, this is what they're built for. So that nesting aspect is just as crucial as her basking. So once she knows, hey, I have somewhere I know I can lay my eggs and it's protected and it's got every element that I need, heat, humidity, protection, the whole nine yards, then she'll proceed with the rest of the cycle. Because mm -hmm. if you don't, it's where you, you know, you'll hear about people that have, uh, you know, a lone female and, you know, hey, she blew up the side of a baseball and then the next day there's... She shit out eggs everywhere. It's like, well, yeah, they're all infertile, but right. you know, obviously, I have a female, and she dumped them because she didn't want to freaking, you know, die from right. from the fucking inbound. Yeah. yeah. So, gee, that's scary to think. And, and, and also, too, guys, I mean, putting the money side apart of what these laces go for, it's a, it's a, it's like a fucking. I mean, this is like a dog. Like you get attached yeah. to it. Like it's it's not a snake in a rack. You no. know what I mean? Like this is something that you are. Constantly building trust with, and uh, you start to notice that it likes you sometimes, and you you know it's just it's a lot different. And so for you to go this far and not just to have these things dialed in for it to die like that, it's pretty. Oh yeah, up. it's it's tough, and in a lot of ways too. I mean, a lot of my you know lace that I keep are not quote unquote like pet friendly or whatever. I mean, yeah, I've been bit I don't know how many freaking times by every one of them out there, cocksuckers. But, I mean, but they're kind of be respected as that. I mean, we're kind of like, yeah. we're not looking for. But the other half, but yeah, animal. I'm, you know, I, I got them dialed in for breeding. Um, so the interactions, with the exception of that male who, like I said, would jump on your back in two seconds and get out of the cage. Um, do you, do you trim your laces nails? No, because <laughs> that's the truth. All the stuff that they have to climb on, they're always they, they they're use them. Yeah, so but you even, take the licks. Even dulling them down, they're still they're freaking yeah. sharp. Yeah. yeah. But um <laughs> no, I, I keep my interactions somewhat to a minimum with them, but again, I'm still able to interact with them. You keep it as needed, right? And exactly. They, they know yeah. who you are and they get it, you know what I mean? Exactly. Um, you know, one thing I do want to mention is you know, you, you do have I mean you have insects, you have chicks, but then you also will offer mice. Um at what point would you offer mice compared to chicks? Like when do you when do you switch that up? Well, you got your your mouse options, you got your chicks option, and then you have your red option. Um, lace wise, I don't do any insects. I never have. I don't think it's mine. Love grasshoppers. Uh, I, <laughs> but I I'm like not saying <laughs> they won't eat them or like big roaches. I'm sure they'll freaking go to town with them. But it does nothing to them. <laughs> I just I've always thankfully have had access to like you know. Pinkies, fuzzies, the whole nine yards, right. and they just seem to gravitate to them. But right. you know, once lace hit like this big, this big, I don't care how many. I, I remember it's funny you say that. I had <laughs> bought um, two semi adults. Uh, they're Merton's monitors from Chris Chris Murray. They're probably I don't know a foot and a half, two feet long. It shout out to Chris Murray, by the way. Yeah, I Chris. Guess, like, Chris is a fucking, another good, respectable fucking monitor breeder, I would say, Chris Murray. So, I'm living in Plainfield. I got him in this big concrete enclosure that I built, which I had to take a fucking sledgehammer to get out of my house. Well, wow. Needless to say, I destroy it. But, <laughs> um, I come home, and both of the Mertens are hanging out. They got a big water tub and all that shit. And, I think I bought like five dozen fucking crickets. Open a bag, dump them in there. Fucking crickets are everywhere. Right. Fucking Mertens are like, what the fuck is this? What the fuck is this thing? They didn't fucking touch one of them. Yeah. I had to take a shop back and suck them all up because I had crickets everywhere. And they didn't give a yeah, fuck. Yeah, they wouldn't fucking touch them. So. <laughs> That's funny you said I just, that. I gave up with, you know, any kind of insects with some of these monitors because they just are like, you know. The fuck you want me to do with it? I mean, the only reason I will say right now, Brian, I even fucking offered grasshoppers is because, God damn it, man, it took me a year and a half to learn how to breed them. And shout out to Kai. You know who Kai is, right? Mm -hmm. you know Kai, right? Boy, Kai right? fan. Kai. I call him Junior. That's my boy Junior. Uh, but, man, Kai 
man, he's been patient with me, and he finally got me to get those things going. And I'm now, fucking kicking ass with the grasshoppers. Bro. Grasshoppers with the green trees? They love them. Fuck yeah. But but, but hold on. I was going to say, right when I, right when they would start flourishing, I put in like six, seven grasshoppers in there, and they were like, what the fuck? But yeah. it's because I they eat good. You know what yeah. I mean? So I was told – Give them a few days without food, oh, yeah. and they're gonna fucking crunch it. And and mind you, they. And what's crazy is my male. He hunts at night. It's um, because I noticed I was like, man, I'm putting these grasshoppers in. The next day they're gone, but they're not eating them during the day. And I noticed the females. Uh, she's the one that prefers pinks or like the fattier yeah. meal, right? Which is fine. I'd rather have the male be lean, anyways. But yeah, you know, they. He, I see him at night. I'll come in at like ten at night, eleven at night, pitch dark, and he's fucking everywhere chasing these grasshoppers oh, shit. at night. You know what I mean? Where the females is knocked out. <clears throat> um, but, you know, I, listen, here's another thing, right? Um, well, just saying, there's so many um, things that you might, like, wait, like like I told you, Brian, I came from the uh, ball python game. Um, mm -hmm. Ball python game is where I kind of got my feet wet. And that's kind of where I was noticing a lot of these quote unquote ball python practices aren't really the best. I'm like, you know, even though it's a ball python, this and that, like, I don't feel like you should feed it so much i feel like there should be a a, a a time and a place where you should feed it when you need to and then the whole seven days of thing i don't know i started it started computing in my head but then as soon as i tapped into other species then i started realizing well you can't fucking do this shit with these species no. you, you overfeed a fucking emerald or you overfeed a, a conjure or whatever like okay even if it lives it ain't gonna breed for you like you're gonna have shit fucking you're gonna have a shit time with that but that's also with the monitors man like if you like there's people out there who just shove rats down their monitors throats I mean, it's kind of talking about that kind of diet for a monitor. I mean, are we shortening the lifespan, you would say? for If you're – all right. Let's say you have like a lone male – whatever. You got a lone male now monitor, and you're shoving 10 mice down his throat a day. Yeah, you'll fucking kill him in a month or a year. It's not ideal. The only power feeding aspect is related to – you know, you're breeding females. Right. Um, and again, it's going to fluctuate root species. I mean, obviously, female blue tree monitor is not going to eat the equivalent of a female water monitor that's cycling, or you're trying to get her cycling. Um, so in that regard, your females are always going to do better with, you know, heavier prey items, um, something you know, again, like you got to, like glowers, your Kimberly rocks are more insectivorous. They eat, you know, a lot of big grasshoppers, locusts, other lizards or whatever. You want to start breeding them, you know, maybe, hey, I gave her a couple of rat pups or a couple of mice pups if they'll even eat them because of how small they are. But that enrichment and that, you know, increase of food has got a lot of fat perspective to it and a lot of more calories and all it's good for egg development it, it's something that hey this is what you need to focus on because right. you want to breed them um but from a male perspective no you don't want to you know you'll produce big fat lazy ass motherfuckers. overweight yeah <laughs> and then the sperm cock you know sperm count goes down a whole nine yards so you know again this is a, a perspective if you look at it from a human perspective you know you don't want like some fat librarian who's like, you know, hey, I'm the talking down and I'm eating fucking eight tacos a day and fat as a house trying to bang some freaking, you know, 110 pound waitress who's, you know. I mean, but with all due respect, I mean, dude, I, I've seen I've seen some fat motherfuckers with a hot chick. But I'm like, dude, how much sex is he really putting in? They're pretty tired, bro. They don't look, they, they put too much work into eating. All right. Maybe there was a bad Sorry, I mean, analogy. I, I, no, but I get what you're Wait, saying. Wait, was that? That was a bad analogy for me? No, that was bad for me. Okay. Anyway, look, you fat fuck. Um, <laughs> the point is... You can't even look at your own dick. I'm just kidding. You want... <laughs> no, man. You want your males lean, skinny, and because... And they're, they're more, you know, prone to breed. They're, they're, they're definitely full of testosterone, and they're on target. They're like, hey, let's get it. So your female, you know... The more fat that she's taking in, the more she can produce album, she can produce eggs, and, you know, she needs to be healthy. She's got to have all that fat produce some nice, healthy eggs. Right. So, um, in that regard, as far as feeding, but that, again, this is another perspective with 
keeping the species again separate. You know, like you notice in my barn when we were out there earlier. That's not a barn, it's a fucking warehouse, bro. <laughs> the warehouse, <laughs> yeah. everything's separate. I don't oh, keep no. them together. Um, and the point of it too is, you know, there's the great aspect of having them together and they, they get to know each other and they're bonded, which is another favorite word of mine is bullshit. Um, they're familiar. They're, they get along in the whole nine yards. But, you know, if you have them together and over the years I've learned, males, they don't give a shit. They don't have any chivalry. To, if you're have them together and they're just starting to get along and you're getting ready to breed them, and you offer any prey item in there, that male will eat every freaking thing you offer. They're dicks. Yeah, they're, they're complete dicks. Yeah. And then if she is laying on the bastion spot, that big fat fuck will come right on top of her, put his fucking hind leg in her egg. Push her. Yeah, the, they do the Heisman. Like, they go the Heisman, bro. They go like this. Yeah, exactly. Get but, out of my way. I'm laying right here. Okay, so check this out. Ready for the curveball, which I'm so excited to talk about because... Fuck, man. Like, I try to be careful putting out videos which are kind of like, well, this shouldn't be happening because yeah. you have all the fucking wannabe experts, right? So I had all these fucking assholes, and you are assholes because all of you are trying to convince me what I have when I'm talking to the fucking man, Brian Waterloo, John, Alex from Sim Container. I'm confirmed I have a pair, okay? But why is a female and a male going at it like that? Um, dude, my female punks the shit in my mouth. And I'm telling you that it's she's she's the same size, if not bigger than him. I don't know if that's the problem, but then again, let's kind of talk there's, about that. Again, there's your compatibility um, aspects of it too. And again, you got to remember your female. She's again put all this energy into. I found the proper nesting. I got all the food in the world I need. I have all the security. I have everything I need. Now I need the biggest. Big dick energy male. Not a tiny dick. Yeah. <laughs> the great way. I need the man. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. Bro. So, oh, man. again, a lot of ways. That makes so much which, sense. That, that makes sense from a small group perspective. Right. It's like, all right, I got one male to choose from, and that female is not going to challenge him because it's like, well, I'm going to fight you off till a bigger guy comes along. Where if you got a big group of them, then, yeah, your males are going to tossle back and forth and all i mean right. the one of the best examples of it and it's not always a hundred percent but again this is where it changes because you got numbers remember way back in the day when steve Irwin was breed, uh breeding perennies um there was pringle pete ledge some other counties fucking mate no these are perennies but like, what do you mean what are the lead what are these names you're saying ledge was like a big male Crinkle was a female. So what, are these are species of perennies, is what you're no, saying? No, it, it's just the names of the, the, the species of the perennies he had. He had like five or six perennies in a big enclosure. But these were the actual names or the names? They're the names that he gave the lizard. Okay, got it. Okay. Like this, I this thought perenny. Like, I thought it was, it said, Ledge sounds like a fucking locality or something. I'm yeah, sorry. No. Okay, so these were his, these were his, his monitors. Okay. Exactly. His, his perennies. What year was this? 90s? 90s. Yeah. But the point was, like Crinkle was a big female and ledge was another big male and pete was another big male and or maybe it was opposite or whatever but um they were in a big group and you know your dominant male always bred with uh crinkle right yeah, i think that was her name but the point was once you got done breeding Ledge or Pete, which are the smaller ones, come next. they come in and be like, I'm going to fucking tag the shit out of it. They, they agree with it. Yeah. So that whole point of it was, again, with like your female kind of besting your male where it's like, well, I need a bigger one to come along. Um, like even in a group setting, it, it's not always a dominant male is going to, you know, be the home run hitter. Right. But – that being said, in a situation where again you only have 1.1, you got one male, one female, right. and who, who, who actually have never done that in the enclosure. So I also want to make that outside. clear too. Yeah. So, mind you, these two always my old room before I moved into the new house in January. My old, my old where they, where they were raised. As soon as they were big enough to roam the room, they roam together. Yeah. No issue. Hey, hey, how are you? Whatever they do their thing, and all of a sudden the new room I move into. 
Mac, Matt, it's like he knew we were somewhere new. And he's like, I don't want to leave. I'm staying right here. I opened up that door. The female's like, I want to be out. And so she was the one just la da 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 da, mostly out. And then all of a sudden, Mac got curious. And I'm like, okay, finally, get curious, right? He would see her and be like, holy shit. And he would run. Yeah. And maybe he thinks that's a fucking male going to fuck me up. I don't, I don't know what it is. But I've never, I'm talking about from a distance, Brian, from across the room. Yeah. I'm like, what are you freaking out about? And he literally runs back into the enclosure. Yeah. And then that one time he ran into her, and that's when shit happened. Well, maybe. That was crazy. Because okay. her coming out first, she might be like, hey, this is, you know, I'm going to establish this. Well, because she stands up like this. Yeah, like, this is my territory. Mean? Yeah. I'm the, you know, I'm the only female in this area. And again, you got to remember that they smell everything. They're pheromones. They're you know, oil factor, everything. They pick up shit that we can't freaking detect. So from that perspective, and because you let her out, she might be like, oh, I'm claiming this. This is my territory. So now you got your male coming out, and, you know, he's younger. He's not, they're both not in a breeding perspective or getting close to it. So, yeah, she's going to chase him off like, hey, you're another female coming to my territory. And maybe he's picking up on her pheromones. She might be maturing before him and be like, you know, I'm a female. This is my area. I don't need anybody in here causing any problems. So, again, you give him a little bit more time. He gets a little more size. And then, say, like, what, what do you put one of your biggest males? Like, what, what if it was the other way around? And I had one of your biggest males roaming that room. He would you, take over immediately. He wouldn't be running away. No. He'd be like, what's up, bitch? And, yeah. he, and it would go down. He'd be chasing her. Right. Yeah. And and this is okay. And what, what made me feel so happy is when you're like, MJ, what are they two? Give them time, man. And I'm yeah. like, and I'm like, I would love to give them time, but I'm being told I'm not being I'm not and I'm not waiting really, oh, I do what I'm told, but I'm just saying, like, I'm being said that they're big enough to to, to, to maybe try to yeah. breed, but just because they're big enough, I don't I'm like, bro, I'm scared to even think of the thought of my female who I'm like she's like my daughter. I don't I'm not I want to dig eggs, but not yet. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm no, yeah. I'm in no rush. You're not ready for prom. No, I'm not ready for prom. I'm like fucking first girl, like girl dance in middle school at, yeah. at best right now. Yeah, I know. Um, again, like uh, Dave Kirshner, his article in uh, Mertanglia, um, he got those to breed at two years old, and I, it was like a, a dynamic pairing. It, everything kind of worked out for him. Um, personally, my first success with, uh, my original female, she had like the three year mark plus, yeah, it was going into literally like this time of year, or actually maybe a couple weeks before, but I had super warmed up everything and, um, they had some decent size to them, but yeah, like the three year mark seems to be. A lot more tolerable, and I think you also have a lot more um, success because it's more regimented. They're 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 used to, you know, your patterns of feeding. Um, once you get them established, you know, it, it's kind of, especially like the warmer climate, the whole nine yards. It, it makes it a lot easier for them to transition into that aspect, but. Um, I mean, there's also a saying within certain species of snakes where, like, they don't go by the size, they go by the age. Yeah. Because, like, you know, they're like size. The Bowens. Bowens. I mean, you know, my Bowens that I had were, I don't know, six, seven years old to where they finally started locking up and all that. And I, I just, I couldn't figure it out. I'm, you know, chasing shadows, dealing with Ari and, like, hey, what's going on here? And talking to this guy and that guy. And it's like, I mean, to think that we're talking about laces, which are my dream species, you've also fucking dabbled with the Bowens. And that's, the Bowens that's like, are, are you kidding yeah. me, bro? What was that? How long ago was this? I actually, I sold my Bowens to get the belts. Nine years ago? Something like that, eight years ago. Wow. And you've, you've known Ari ever since? I've known Ari for that's my yeah, dog, too man. long. Shout out to Ari Flagel. Love you, man. Um, um, but yeah, fuck man. you, Ari. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, Ari, dude, I love Ari. But... Um, shit. dude, I had the Bolins, and when I figured out, and especially from Ari, you fuck, um, all his, I started listening to uh, all his podcasts with uh, Owen and uh, what's his name? Is it from, the Morelia Pythons Radio? Yeah, yeah, 
And, dude, everything I already started saying, I'm like, fuck. I did all that because I, I didn't keep my bowlings like yeah. you could keep bowlings. I had them in a big freaking eight by eight by like the humongous. fucking male like the monitors. Right. Yeah, it's actually how to mail them. I still I get the cooler temps. On my computers. Yeah, um, you have cooler temps or no? The floor in my basement was sixty five degrees, yeah. and I had the top was I think one hundred and ten one hundred five. And I had a big row of basking lights up there, but it was a big T shape. And then in the middle, I put like a big giant. Um, no, it was like a dendrophilus. Or, it was a big giant plant. And I made a nest box around it. The female had fucking buried herself inside of there. And I had swelling, mid body swelling, ovulation with her. That male courted the crap out of her. It was always in the nest box, or were they outside doing it? Outside of the cage. Okay. Um, but anytime, dude, he he tried breeding work for like for a year. As soon as it hit like seven or eight feet, um, I mean, dude, even the shit that Ari's posted within the last few years, you see courting, you see yeah. swelling, and I'm like, Ari, this is it for you, buddy. And he he's like, no, it's not. I'm like, yeah. dude, this is it. I'm like, bro, that's an ovulation. She looks huge, and then nothing happens. She. The female I had made a nest inside. Of, she tore apart that plant. Like I said, I got the pictures on it on my computer, and nothing happened. And I just I gave up. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, <laughs> but that's the thing. Like you know, anything about Ari, man. God bless him, man. But fuck, this guy went through everything that he's gone through, uh-huh. and then he had his fucking shit burned down, man. Yeah. Felt so bad for him. Um, but, you know, I don't know. Ari's a real true keeper. Like, that guy, what he does for this hobby, man, as far as the passion behind the animals, I mean, you can't really, you don't, you don't ever meet a guy like Ari. I can tell you that much. Yeah. No, he's definitely, definitely hardcore. It's like uh, your buddy, Chad Gray. You're gonna... Chad. Oh, my God, yeah. man. Chad Gray. <clears throat> it took me years to finally get Chad Gray to sit down with me, which is happening tomorrow night, guys, live and direct from the hotel lobby at Tinley. It's going to be awesome. Uh, but Chad Gray, man, like another guy I highly respect, diverse in so many different species yeah. of pythons. I don't know what his monitor experience is. Has he ever did? No, I, I, my only dealing with Chad is pertaining to the Bolands. Um, right. But yeah, he's been a solid dude. Let's talk about how you feel overall, man. Um, because obviously, one thing you've shared tonight, and I'm very, you know, mad respect to you sharing your your the, the ups and downs with keeping laces. But if Brian gets things cracking, right? Like, let's say, you know. It's more good luck than any anything else, right? And and things are going your way. Um, how do you plan on delegating the sales behind lace monitors? Because there's people out there who think laces still cost too much, but then there's people out there who've been looking at laces and say, dude, like when are laces gonna go back up in price? Um, where do you see the market right now with laces? I mean, you personally, like do you feel like how things are going, like meaning like where your prices are at, do you feel like I don't feel like I'm ever gonna switch them anytime soon? Or do you feel like they need to go up or they need to go down? Well, for one, as quite a few people out there know now, I'm done with the bells. I'm done with dealing the whole bullshit about, is this a super bell? Is it a frost bell? Is it a fucking this bell? I'm fucking done. They're bells. I don't give a shit if they're super clean, super this, whatever. They're fucking bells. Be thankful they're out here and people are fucking breeding them. That's one. Two, all I'm doing is fucking normals. I don't want any more, any more fucking conversation about fucking bells. I don't care if they're morphs. I don't care if they're fucking super hybrids. They're fucking head. The you know, they're, they're double that. I'm done. I don't fucking you care. Know, you know how many people hit me up? I don't talent? give a shit. I've had I have over six people, and I, I swear I want to say your names. Six people who told me to tell you that there is a Super Bells and you're fucking Great. Wrong. Super Bells. Have at it. <laughs> fucking buy them at fucking 10, 15, 20 fucking grand. Have at it. I am done with fucking Bells. All you guys who have Supers, Frost, whatever fucking name you want to make. What the fuck make, is Frost? Where did that come from? Got me. Have at it. <laughs> Take them. They're, they're, they're all yours. I'm done with the Bell market. You guys know what you're doing. Add some fucking retic fucking morph to it. Have at it. Have fun. Done. Okay, okay. How about this? I do notice that there has been a, a an amazing, impressive-looking normal lace 
that's called a, a tiger, a tiger or a tiger. Is that another Jesus fucking price? Like, no. Please tell me. I mean, I've right, heard this. There's three fucking lease monitors out there. There's Southern Australia, there's Northern Australia, and there's a the Middle Australia. They all have different variations to them. The ones up north have a lot of spots. The ones down south have a lot less spots and more banding. The ones in the middle, like Sydney, Queensland, the whole nine yards, have a lot of banding and have a lot of spots. Again, they're fucking links. Be glad you could fucking get them. End of story. I have er, mine right now that you just looked at. Technically, oh would be tight. I mean, there's the yeah. ones I looked at. Technically, would be Queensland. Again, it's just the, the biggest aggravation with this aspect with lace monitors is all these cocksuckers out there who are like, you know, oh. Uh, yeah, it's great lace, but I'd rather buy this one from this guy. And it's like it's not a tiger. It's not a tiger. Face. It's not a tiger. It's not an albino snow sulfur or whatever. It's like I don't see any frost. Hey, in this. asshole! <laughs> they're not freshly imported. You can't fucking get them. They're not coming in next month from fucking Florida. So deal with it. I mean, okay, but let's just say out like theoretically, you know what you have with your laces, right? Is there any other type of that level of lace you wouldn't mind adding to your, your no, mix? No, that, that's the whole point is that you don't know what you're going to hatch because all the lace that have been here and not been fucking imported have all kinds of different fucking bloodlines. So it's all in it. It's all in it. Yeah, they're all over the place. So just keep breeding it and you're going to get all You're going to get all of it is what you're saying. Which what's crazy because the, the, the female, I don't know if the female you got from Dawn, but... I mean that's a lighter looking lace. Like, yeah, it's like, but she got some blue. She got some, some yellow. blue, right? Whatever. Right. So should I just fucking pro? Hey, these are yellow babies from this blue female. Again, it's a new thing. <laughs> it's a new thing. This is a super tiger hypo fucking morph. Get off the fucking bullshit. They're fucking lace. Be thankful you could fucking get them out here. That's all I gotta say. As far as morphs, this, that, the whole fucking nine yards. All you guys are making money off of all of whatever fucking name you can put on them. Have at it. Happy for you. I want to let you know right now, man, the most, other than you, the other people I respect the most really back you up when you come to this shit because they're, they're not posting their shit as super bills, man. I mean, because, hmm. I mean, listen, at the end of the day, one thing I can't stand about the ball python game is how things are marketed. Like, hmm. It's always like, Oh no, sorry. This is a lead to that, and now this is that, and which is like, okay, I get it, but like, what the fuck? When does it end? Yeah, I'm, I'm sick. Like, I'm just like, dude, I just want to make something cool without people saying I can't buy it because it doesn't make sense with this, bro. Fuck, I'm over it. It's the animal. I love the animal, and that's why, like, after walking into a fucking place like yours. Dude, I cannot wait to just turn in the fucking towel with the ball pythons, man. I really can't. No, no I, I, I gotta tell you, I got, I got a whole. 20 foot wall that's dedicated to ball pythons. You know what I can fucking do to that wall, bro? I'm terrible. Well, it, my theory has always been ball python guys will not be happy until they produce a ball python that's completely invisible. And it's just <laughs> two little it's black gone! dots. And it's like, those are the eyes. This is the invisible ball python. Let's make it visible again. But again, that being two said, black uh, eyes. <laughs> Just two little ink dots. I mean, even okay, because if we, if we could even talk about the reticulated uh, market a little bit, right? Like, for one thing, I realized I'm like, okay, these snakes that don't go nearly as much as ball pythons are actually more appealing and they're more prettier than these ball pythons. You know how retics get, but it's a retic, it's fucking huge, sure. But then the super dwarf market came, right? And I was like, I was like more intrigued to the locality part of things, and now not the morph, but now morph starts getting involved, and now there's big. Terrible mainland breeders trying to say they have super dwarf shit. It's just fucking it all up. I just want to work with something. It's like what you just said. Like, listen, motherfuckers, this has been in this goddamn country for years, and you're going to get it all. Just keep breeding, and you'll yeah. get it all. I don't know. I just want to be more simpler, simple, simple about what I'm, what I do. Yeah. Well, from the the retic or uh, retic perspective, which I don't have a lot. I I do. There was a lot of retic back in the day um, when Chris Brown had vital exotics i was one of the few people that was able to <clears throat> chris brown or chad brown no chris brown chris go to his house oh. um and he was cracking on like mochas and super motleys and like all these different morphs they were cool i freaking love retakes but um 
unfortunately, they're just, they're still not recognized, or at least I don't think that, like the Super Dwarf and all that, but I still love him. Um, yeah. What's his name? Uh, Reach Out Reptiles. Garrett. Garrett. Yes. Yeah. I mean, he's, I've seen some phenomenal freaking retakes from him. And I'm like, he's a marketing dude, guru, man. I freaking guy. love to fucking have some for me, but yeah. retakes are, you know, I had them back work. in the day. And, yeah. They're a cool python, but you know, I mean, nobody wants to move a sixteen fucking foot fire hose of like from one cage. To the <laughs> That's next. full blow, like like a fire hose that has just nothing but water being gushed yeah. out of it. Um, yeah, but it's the same with like you know, but my but but honestly, a big your giant laces, fucking water monitor. You have if, if a big giant lace too. I mean, yeah. I mean, you're you're gonna have to clean up shit at some point. Um, but then again, it's like what? Okay, like there could be a time and place where. I could throw my hands up in the air and look at all these retics in the room and say, what the fuck am I doing? I don't see myself doing that with monitors, man. Because first and foremost, how many monitors can you put in a room? You can't put that much. Yeah, you're limited. Right? So think about how many people are able to do what they can with retics to the point where they know, yeah, motherfucker, you're getting away with a 4 by 2 enclosure for this goddamn 12-foot snake, but you're dealing with a lot of shit. Yeah. Face is being pushed. All this stuff, like stuff that doesn't make you feel good as a keeper. Yeah. I want to feel good. I don't want to, like, bro, like, that's the biggest thing, Brian. It was, I was like, okay, because I want to say that the retics are like the monitors of the snake world. Yeah, like, they, they need, giant they need this shit. I remember um, there was a documentary, like, like 100 fucking years ago, where the Barkers, they donated Colossus or... Um, what the hell is it? It was a, a giant retake they had. They gave it to like the Dell Zoo or some shit. And they had like this big giant 30 by 20 foot enclosure. Colossus, I think mm -hmm. that was his name. Um, but they donated it to the zoo because they're like, he was just, he was too big. He was like 18 feet long or something. Big giant freaking retake. Big female. Yeah. But it was a cool enclosure. And again, I'm not shitting on the retic guys or the ball python guys. No, the retic the retic guys are shitting on themselves at this point. Like, and it, it, it not because they want to, but because just how much they've let themselves down. Like, the retic world is not a good place. I have people I respect the shit out of in the retic world, but it's like because of the there's not enough of your mentality for the lace monitors. There's not enough yeah. people with that mentality for the retics. So there's people well, yeah. things that are just they're just way in over their head, bro. Yeah. And it's like, what are you gonna do? Yeah, I would love to take like that big giant ten foot by ten foot by twelve foot enclosure I have out there in the back of the barn. Put a big fucking retake in there. I fucking loved it. Right. That'd be like the perfect enclosure for it. It'd have all the height, big pool of water, the whole nine yards. But yeah, I get it. And again, I, I just, you know, I've had this argument with people before with the, you know, whether it's ball pythons, retakes, berms, the whole nine yards. Um I don't know. Part of it is like I get the breeding aspect and you need to maximize your space. You need to make a profit and all that. Um, and you're talking about like, you know, F2, F3 generations of animals that are being captive bred and you're just. Well, we're talking about the good one. That, that ain't happening no yeah. more. It's all gone. But um, my, I guess, argument is more for the guys who are not keeping you know, a bunch of different species and they're like, hey, I got one or two or three or four. And it's like, well, then make them the, the most out of it. Even if you have one. Right. I mean, I get, I get a couple customers and I want to just freaking choke that are like, you know, keeping shit in aquariums and it's like... But you'll, you know, you'll still sell to them? No. I'm done. There's a lot... This... I mean, because is, is that the biggest slap in the face you would say is like when you you finally sell something to somebody you tell them what they need to do and they don't do it mm -hmm. like it's like what the fuck man like because well yeah it, it's again it's not an insult to me so much it's an insult to the animals like i put all this time yeah. and effort to it you just paid a Long shitload money. of money yeah. it's not like you fucking bought like a hundred dollar fucking king snake Seen a corn snake yeah exactly it's like you put all this money into it, so why the fuck would you fucking, you know, cheap out on the enclosure? The most important part. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I try to explain to these, a lot of my customers, too. It's like, look, I understand the initial investment is expensive, but... It's more than that. <laughs> it's a lifetime couple expense. A couple years from yeah. the road, you're paying three times that freaking amount. Yeah. So, you know, 
That's Something what I'm saying. Like pe people think, oh wow, I got I got the money I need for the lace. But no, hello, you need more money after that. Like that don't like people save up to get something for like, I feel like if you're saving up to get an animal, mm -hmm. oh my God, what are you doing? Like like unless it's all covered, I'm not talking about obviously a ball python because obviously you got rack space. But I'm saying if you're saving up so much money to get a, a monitor species and the money behind the enclosure isn't invested yet, what are you doing? Yeah. Like because now you're putting yourself in in so many situations where money could go wrong, and now you're forced to keep this thing in a tank and it's so big. Like, bro, you know how many times I've been to fucking people's collection and a year ago they're like, "Oh, I'm gonna upgrade it," and I'm like, "Bro, you haven't upgraded it still." Yeah. Like, and, and I feel like you just tell people you're gonna upgrade it yeah. and you're not gonna upgrade it. So I, I, I mean, stop. feel like a dick for calling it out, but that I don't. Be, I feel like, dude, if I, because here's the thing, Brian, I saw people with species I would dream to have. And I'm like, bro, you keep it like that. Yeah. And I told myself, because, dude, let's be real about something, Brian. You probably don't know. I mean, I think you would respect the movement behind this, but two years ago, there was a, a big thing I started, and and only because how passionate I was behind it. I started this movement called Fuck Bob Smith. Okay, because when Forrest passed away. Um, his wife jumped on board and wanted to be a part of the podcast. So she was getting emails from a Bob Smith saying, this MJ guy's terrible for what's going on. Like, like get rid of the MJ guy. Right. And so I always knew there was a Bob Smith, by the way, it was a fake Bob Smith, it was just a fake email. Right. Never heard of him. Does it, Cause it's a fake, but, but it turns out this Bob Smith was somebody I knew, like oh. found out who it was. And it was somebody who was so against me having lace monitor. Like really? very against it. Like to the point where our, we had no issue until I told him I was getting a lace monitor. Then he unfollowed me and then everything started going down right then and there. Do I know him? <laughs> Maybe we could talk. I mean, if people know who the real Bob Smith is and it's out there, but I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to, I'll tell you afterwards, but I'm just saying there are certain things that could happen to you in this industry um, that could just make people feel a certain way. I got to tell you right now, Brian, I don't feel like you're in that position because like you're respected. Like you're, you're not a fucking, Hey, look at me. I'm on YouTube. Like, and I feel like that's why people, that's love why you. I am fucking people done. You. I'm off of like Facebook. I don't fucking, I, I literally social media could kiss my ass. I fucking, God I, bless I've, you for I've that, been man. a hermit for, I don't know how many years because I, not anymore. He's here. <laughs> Every, more, hey, listen, supposedly we're going to have round tables every Tinley here from now on. Just so you, you know, go. monitor round tables happening every Tinley here at Brian Waterloo's Thursday night. So if you're if you're a legit <laughs> monitor breeder and you want to be at this round table, Brian Susan, okay, fucking Mike monitors, Uncle Mike, you hear me? John, Alex, we're doing it right here. But anyways. All right. I can Brian, yes. I love Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Brian's the only one that got the folks up. Well, I, I, <laughs> Bonnie just, and, just, and just, Mike and Alex are, you know, whatever. Family. Yeah, I mean, They're family, family, exactly. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, I just, I, that's why I've gotten off of Facebook. And I've gotten, you know, I'm very little on Instagram. I just, I'm an old fart. I don't fucking, you know, I like classical music. I mean, I read articles. I mean, I'm just. He builds, I'm like, not, he builds like model tanks and shit like that. Build tanks. I just, lives lives yeah. a good life. <laughs> I stay away from it. I just, you know. Um, but understand, bro, it's your generation, too. Like, you're an OG, man. Like, you, you've been around the block. I, 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 I'm not quite there, but I'm also raised in the 80s, and I know how much I can't stand social media, bro. Social media, like, listen, I have a certain strong opinion that could sometimes put me in a bad place, but, but it's my opinion. This is me. I don't give a yeah. fuck, right? But because I have sponsors, because I have people who support me, that makes me vulnerable. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day, Brian, I wouldn't be even be sitting next to you if it wasn't for this podcast. Like, and, and, no, I get and that. I'm so aspect. happy yeah. I'm here with you because and I'm glad I'm able to. That's crazy. You know, share my experiences with you, but um, but your, a lot of your experience is making it long. Like what you tell me, Brian, is obviously being sponge. But bro, like you, like I am trying to do what you do at some point. Yeah. And, and, and no, I get it. I appreciate it, and definitely, it, it, trust me. Twenty years ago, when I was, you know making phone calls with George Horn and Gerard Visser. Yeah. I would love to have been like, Hey, can I put you on a computer? Okay, let's talk. Yeah. yeah. Instead of, Hey, I let's bought a round tip trick it, you know, ticket to freaking, you know, Amsterdam and I'll meet you at the zoo. See you there soon. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely, again, this is another aspect of from a customer perspective. It's like you motherfuckers, you have the entire world at your fingertips yeah 
do some research. You know, I the customers that I get that call me are like, you know, at 2 a.m., who are you feeding it? It's like, what the fuck? What? And then, you know, I get the other ones who are like, uh, you know, 10 gallon aquarium is good for it, right? And I was like, did you fucking read anything in the fucking post that I put? Or it's just that aspect of the hobby. It's like I got 30 people I got to go through before I find one solid guy. It's like, hey, this is what I work with. This is the cage I'm going to put it in. You know, I'm offering this prey items. What do you, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, um, my buddy, uh, what's his name? Toad Ranch, another guy. He's doing a bunch of cages and all that shit. Freaking nail it with the lace. Great job. Um, my buddy from uh, Alabama. Um, shit, I can't think of his name right now. He's on there as a lizard guy from Alabama. It, these are F2 lace that I sold him. He's got them breeding. You know, they're ready to go right now. Jared, mm. great. Um, so basically, it, it, it definitely conveys a lot with customers that are actually, you know, they get your aspect of it. They want your opinion. They're like, they want your advice. You feed it to them and they, they go through with it, which is great. Um, but it just, it's unfortunate again, where certain aspects of this hobby where it's like, you know, if you're going to bug somebody for a question or, Hey, I have an interest in buying it again, you know, you're buying something that's a couple thousand dollars. Right. And you're asking the most basic question out to there. To somebody who's putting years and fucking dedication. This is what I don't understand. Like, I I, I, um, I also understand that there's people who've been following me for a long time. And they're, they're, they're of course, they, they, they want me to do well and stuff. But then they they happen to hit me up like, hey, man, when you when are you going to have, like, 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 not even like, hey, how's your day going? It's like, hey, when are you going to have emerald tree bows? I don't fucking know. Well, listen, I want to be put on the list. Okay, so do I. I don't give a fuck. Like, you think I'm going to be like... Oh shit! What? Okay, what's your first name? Yeah. What's your email? No, bro, get the fuck away from me. If we're talking about a ball python, of course, but you're asking me to be put on a list of something I can't even make yet. Yeah. Like, and that kind of puts stress on me. <laughs> like, don't ask me for that right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? No, and I get that aspect. And it, it, but, but here's the other half of it too. And this is something again I try to convey. You know, within this community. I mean, all right, look at like my green bass list. Freaking love them. Gorgeous, man. Um, cool looking, man. So, Eric Haycraft, the guy I bought right. it from, right. um, I was up his ass. I'm like, hey, what are you feeding them? What are you? I'm like, this is my... I showed him cages. I'm like, hey, will this work? Can I do it as this? Can I do it as this? He's like, that's perfect. That'll work. You got any questions? Let me know. So, he's helped me along the lines. And, you know, I've kind of broken away from him a little bit because it's like... Hey, I think I've done everything you're right. He's like, fucking A. He's like, the cage is great. They're eating good. They're growing. They're going to be breeding soon. You need any questions? Like, he's been real helpful. Um, the Devin Douglas guy that I bought my Australian water dragons from, same thing. You know, it's like, I've never come across like a know it all. Like, well, I'm buying these and I need it. So, in a lot of ways, that aspect, it'll convey well with the lace from a sales perspective if. Again, you put in the work. Right. You're not, you know, because I've had people before, like, what part of Africa are you from? I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Or <laughs> <laughs> you talk 30 minutes about something, you're like, okay, well, you show up to India? You son of a bitch, bro. Get the fuck yeah. away from me, man. Um, I, I don't know. At the end of the day, it's as easy as it is to find information. You have to do your own homework. You got to find out what the fuck it is. Well, you have that the you world want me. at your fingertips. So take That's the time the to research. Exactly. Slow down. That's always been some of my biggest issues with some people where it's like, you know, I'll follow you on, you know, back in the day when I was on Facebook or whatever. It's like, right. you know, you posted six weeks in a row about the new iPhone coming out. And then you want to buy a lace from me, and you're still asking me what temperature should I keep them at? It's like, dickhead. Go your iPhone. All this time <laughs> researching an iPhone, it's going to last six months, and then you're asking me about a lizard that'll last, you know, 20, 30 years in your fucking life. It's because people want things handed to them, bro. They want, they don't want, they just want to be a lace breeder. They just want to be like, fuck it. Look, 
They want to be your boy who just walked in and saw a baby lace walk across the cage. Like, it didn't even work like that. But that's also the case with a lot of animals, man. That's why it's a it's a it's a double edged sword with these influencers because as much as we bring people from the outside in, they think it's just as easy because I have money, I'll buy this shit and watch what I do with it. And and it's, that and that's what makes it makes it sour for people like us. You know what I mean? Um, no, it doesn't work out that way. Yeah. And you know, I, I guess the the best approach to it is again, I get you know, I got a couple of buddies right mine up. They're they're getting into you know new species of monitors, and it's like they're putting the cart before the horse. And like, just it, you might in six months be like, these are the worst freaking things I've ever had. Yeah, I don't want to deal with them. No shit, I don't want to. I, I'm ready to sell them. It's like you, you definitely you got to ease your way into it. And if you have that, you know. Mentality where I'm, hey, I'm going to breed them. I'm going to be successful. And I'm going to make money. It's like you're just you're setting yourself up to fail yeah. completely because you have to have that passion to keep them off the bat. And, and we're, we're talking about setting yourself for failure on top of failure because even if you do everything that Brian Waterloo tells you what to do, you're going to fail. Like, bro, like exactly right now, I'm you're still, making your life harder. Like he still fails. Like you don't stop. Yeah. I got a, a freezer full of. A, a, Dead hatchlings. Don't we all? <laughs> that you know, they they went full full term, and I'm like, fuck. I'm like, this this egg was perfect. He cut the egg open. And it's a dead baby in there. It's like, I don't know what the fuck it did wrong. I mean, right now that female that we just filmed earlier, I had I, I got everything written down. I'm like, all right, here's being a cycle. Here's this. She should be on, on track right. with all, and she is giving me nothing but freaking. A play, you know, ups and downs, peaks and valleys. Right. And it's like, well, what the fuck? What, yeah. am, what am I missing here? So it's not always a guarantee that everything that you have written down in stone is going to, you know, equal success. Right. You always got to be prepared for that curve. But the one thing I will say that it definitely helps is I've looked at notes that I wrote down from fucking five years ago. And that female is identical to what this female is doing now. And that other female is the one that produced a shitload of lace for me. So, so it's all systematic once you got it all looked. Like once yeah. it's all where it needs to be, it's systematic, which is going to bring me to the wrap up question before we get to some house. I got some round two house questions for you. Sure. Just so you know, uh, Brian. But main title of tonight's episode is understanding breeding cycling for lace monitors so how can anyone especially like this is a great question for me because i've never seen any breeding action between my two you saw what happened right but how do i notice that my female could be going into a cycling like like how how somebody who's never seen something like that kind of be prepared or or realize holy shit maybe my female even though they're not breeding i think she's cycling like how do we what are some signs for that so I'm a, a lot of it. Ready to talk. I can't, um, I can't hold it. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Um, basically, for the, the, the most part, and you know, one of my probably the biggest piece of advice is check out Dave Kirshner's videos, Crack Doc Two on YouTube. He covers this to a T. Um, literally, it's you know your female refusing food. Um, her laying positions where she is basically laying vertically horizontal um little test digging um you know basically those different aspects of the early stages of vital genesis because basically all the uh development starting to go into her mid body you have mid body swelling um essentially like in my case um just the just abrupt feeding is completely put to a halt um they're not eating and then they're basking a lot and again it's just the odd laying positions where you know they're supporting their belly from like their shoulders and their belly's hanging down or sometimes they'll have their belly hanging up and their shoulders are down so those are Definitely something to look into. And then, like I said, minor test digging around substrate, the whole nine yards. So those are some key things to look into. 
are there any kind of like kind of signs of like because <clears throat> i've noticed that with my persinuses my female got super rounded right okay um when you see something like that and they stop eating that's yep. kind of like yeah that's that's telltale sign so that pull the male out first, first and foremost right or, or like because that's another thing that that female if she feels threatened she'll fuck that male up at some point yeah definitely um and again that's why i've always been a big proponent of housing animals separately because um you know your typical male is always going to want to give it a shot whether it's pre-cycle post-cycle um or just a general introduction it's just how it goes so um knowing what's going on with your female and again so we're taking notes and being visual right. helps so if she's swelling up and she's doing a little bit digging how long ago she lay my girl's never oh you're talking about my persinas yeah she january january 4th okay january February, march yeah she's they're already getting locks right now they're he's already going after her right now okay so three months over three months it was uh well three months and two weeks ish does that seem about right? I think she might have missed a cycle. Usually, like in my case, especially with the lace. Um, so that first clutch of eggs, it drops. Right. And within 17 to 20 days, because I've been feeding the crap out of her, she cycles again, and they're going at it. She swells up. She's doing an odd belly hang. She's vertical the whole nine yards. Right. And especially with something like uh, your persinus complex, greens or blues, cordensis, blacks, the whole nine yards, because they're, you know, like green tree pythons, they're breeding year round. They're constantly at it. So um, I would think that she'd probably even cut that cycle down to maybe, you know, 10 to 15 days after she laid. I mean, I don't know. From what I, from what I heard, by the time, and this is with persinuses, right? I heard by the time your your clutch is hatching out, like by the time they're pipping, she's dropping that other clutch. From what I heard with persinuses, I don't yeah, it should be quicker than that. I mean, like from the the lace perspective, like my breeding cycle, every two months I'm getting eggs. Right. So it's like six months of um. Breeding, cycling, the whole nine yards, and then six months of brumation. And then that following year, the six months that they're breeding, all those eggs are hatching. Right. Okay. Huh. Now you remember, again, lace are temperate species. Right. You know, they they can tolerate being cooled down. It's not necessarily, you know, the, the be all end all to get them to breed, but, you know, it's a natural occurrence with them in the wild. And right. personally, I prefer it because yeah, it's six months of me not feeding them, cleaning shit, changing water, and a whole nine yards. I mean, it's, I mean, I'm obviously giving them fresh water, but from a husbandry perspective and feeding perspective, it's a nice little vacation for them. And it, right. it benefits their life. I think it, it adds a lot of longevity. Um, again, Kirshner has you know, in personal conversations with him, giving me his aspects and his thoughts about it. And I agree with it. I mean, it, it's, again, it's a natural occurrence. So. so would you encourage, um, like, if there's anyone out there who's like, dude, I'm just in trying to enjoy this process. And if I could get one clutch a year, I'm cool with that. Is that okay? Like, do you feel like that's probably yeah. a better thing for the female, maybe? even if like, Well, in the wild, again, it's it's something that is naturally going to occur. They're, they're not meant to produce three, four, five, six clutches of eggs a year. Just one clutch. Mm -hmm. Because of the timing of it, when she's laying, um, and how the season works, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, Southern Australia or Northern Queensland, it's it's one clutch. Um, yeah. They just, they don't have the weather, they don't have the, the prey availability, the whole nine yards to, to do it twice. So a lot of Australian keepers, ironically, who keep them outside year round, they're one clutch guys and 
a lot of them too, they're females are four or five years old before they get their first clutch. How many times have you experienced a male breeding with a female who's not cycling? Anytime you put a male with a female. It could happen. Yeah. Because okay. again, the male, as soon as he senses it's a female, he again it's go time. They have that, you know, it's again, being at a bar with a, you know, you're the only guy in a bar with a bunch of chicks. You're fucking you're hitting everyone like, hey, I'll buy you a drink. So yeah, they don't, you know, they don't register. I mean, they'll register it when it's, you know, she's cycling, then they really concentrate. But the second you put a male with a female, yeah, he's immediately gonna be twitching heads and like all over her and then she's gonna be running all over the place to get away from her because right. that's like the immediate thought process. Like, holy shit, there's a female, let's mount. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, yeah, because I mean, e even in the snake world, you got males that just fucking breed anything. You got snakes that will breed themselves. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? They don't give a fuck. So exactly. Yeah. So, well, listen, this has been in a great two-hour episode, man. I mean, went by quick. We have these wrap-up questions before we let you go. No problem. Um, and I know we have a big weekend of Tinley activities ahead. I'll be at uh, Tinley. He will be at <laughs> Tinley, man. Best believe it. But uh, guys, get the likes up for Brian Waterloo. It is hot tea question time. Special. Round two hot tea questions for you, Brian Waterloo. Are you ready for these or what? Yes, sir. All right, here we go. Starting from the top. Favorite dwarf monitor species? I like the uh, I like the, the Kimberleys and I like the, what do you call it? Um, ah, shit. Um, Ackies? No, the, 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 the Shit. You're talking about the ones that, uh, uh, oh my God, hold the on. The Kims and. Um, the one that Mike has, the one he loves. Yeah. Oh my God. The, the Pillar Parensis. Pil yes. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. Mike's Rusties. obsessed with him. Okay. Favorite of boreal snake? I, I love green trees and mangroves. What are your thoughts on the ball python community? Keep going. It, it's helped this reptile community get to where it's at right now. As much as I. Not a big ball python guy, but keep going. Favorite reptile show? I've never been outside of Tinley. Shocking. <laughs> Dude, we got to get you to the West Coast, man. I, I, I got to go it. to Daytona and all nine yards. One place you recommend to go eat dinner while you're at Tinley? Primal was really good. Big steak joint. If you could get in there, by the way. It's pretty, yeah. Pretty booked. Um, favorite or college sport? Though. Uh, football. Least favorite sport? Soccer. <laughs> I can't I'm stand sorry. soccer. Um, how about this? To spray or miss a lace monitor or to never spray or miss a lace monitor? Probably missed. Okay. A cut or no cut? Would you ever cut a lace or monitor egg or would you never no, cut? never cut. Never, never. Even if... Even if you're Uncle Mike. No, I still wouldn't cut it. <laughs> Here, my mean average. So, lace monitor eggs take X amount of time, but my mean average is 235 to 245 days, but I've had them hatch at 225, and I've also got, had them go to 290. Okay. So I never cut. Sorry, Mike. Love you. Best beginner monitor species to work with? Acti. Ideal diet for an adult lace monitor? Uh, rodents and birds. Steak or fish? Musky. What? What'd you say? Steak or fish? Oh, steak. What'd you say? Musty? Musky. Okay. <laughs> Little word association. First thing to come to mind Australia. Pareni. Indonesia. Croc monitor. First time monitor breeder. Frank Reedus. First time monitor customer. Oh shit. I can't remember. If it came down to you deleting one species of monitors, and no you do no, nothing bad out there, but if you if you if you could just say one species of monitors, we could just go ahead and say, fuck it, leave it alone, don't work with it. Whoa. Savannas, Niles. Okay, going more. <laughs> oh my God, Brian. 
listen, dude, we just had shy of 60 people tapped in for tonight's episode. A bunch of monitor heads. What do you have to say to everyone out there who loved tonight's episode? I mean, I got to tell you, the chats were going off the entire time. You had Sweden, you had uh, Nor, uh, you had um, excuse me, Amsterdam in the building. You had Europe people in here learning, saying they've never heard information like this where they're from. So, what do you have to say to everyone out there who loved tonight's episode? Well, thanks, folks, for tuning in. I really appreciate all the uh, accolades and everyone checking in on it. Um, just take what you can, glean from it. Um, especially if you're working for lace monitors, check out Dave Kirshner's Croc Docs videos. They, they can't be beat. Um, and I really appreciate everyone that's uh, kind of checked into it to hear from, you know, my limited experience with it. Um, I'm always available. You can reach me through uh, Instagram and um I don't know. I, I want to thank MJ for taking this time to come out here and you know host us from my house and um I don't know. I really just humbly appreciate everyone checking in and unfortunately I there's not a lot of you know social media that I'm on or available through but Waterloo Lace. Waterloo yeah. underscore lace. Get him cracking. I'm gonna convince this guy to start posting more. <laughs> I promise you, okay? But yeah. Instagram would help. I'm telling you right now. That's my Instagram thing, but again, um and, and, I really appreciate everyone checking in. Um and they like said check out Dave stuff. Um and check me out on Instagram. I'm usually <laughs> on there I could you know, help whatever and do what I can to help everyone. But again, just, you know, read about your species, learn about them, learn Seriously. about their habitats in the wild. And, you know, really consider if this is a species that you want to work with, everything that's involved with them, how big they get, what they require. And, you know, it'll make you for a better keeper. So, again, uh, and think about it like this, guys. Imagine what you would want. And this is to any future lace keeper or current lace keeper, but imagine what you would want to ask somebody like Brian Waterloo in person. Carry that with you all the time because if you're going to ask this guy a fucking weak ass question in person, I guarantee Brian's probably not going to talk to you ever again. Okay. Don't waste this guy's time, but don't waste your own time. Put in the fucking research, put in the work because Brian, if somebody comes with you with a fucking intelligent question, something that might actually make you think you kind of respect them for it. Don't you? I'll spend all day with him. There you go. And, uh, Brian, I cannot wait to spend the weekend with you. Thank you so much to everyone who watched tonight. Please hit that subscribe button, notification bell, drop a comment. Let me know what you like best out of tonight's episode, Two Hours of Heat. And this is one of many rounds to have with Brian Waterloo, okay? I can tell you that much. Brian, have a good night. Thank you so MJ, much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, guys. I'll see you guys. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.